Hello, the internet. Happy Friday and welcome to Enter the Popverse. I am Ashley Victoria Robinson, your video producer and host here in the Popverse, which is, of course, a virtual realm created by Read Pop, where we are celebrating the best in TV, movies, and comics. As always, you can get the full Popverse experience if you visit thepopverse.com, where you can see all the cool articles and features and lists and photos and videos and everything else that we are getting to each and every single day. And of course, for the full Popverse experience, so you never miss out on a single thing. Don't forget to get yourself a Popverse membership while you are over there. Oh, my friends, at this very second happening right now, it is San Diego Comic-Con, one of the meccas of the geek world. We are live in San Diego right now. We're on the floor of San Diego Comic-Con, walking around, doing booth tours, doing interviews, doing fun videos, getting all kinds of stuff for you to see. So I know you might be perplexed as to what I'm doing here talking to you. Don't worry. We have a full episode of Enter the Potverse today. It's stacked. We have two incredible interviews bookending this episode. If you are watching this from San Diego Comic-Con, hello. I hope like myself, you are hydrating. And if you're coming this weekend and you want to make sure that you find me in all possible places, I do want to let you know that I'm going to be appearing on three panels. So you can find me on July 20th hosting the Jeff Lemire Spotlight panel at 12 noon. Two Canadians for the price of one panel. On July 22nd, you can find me on the Hey There, Hey That's Just Like Me when superheroes represent their readers talking about my comic book writing experiences. And on July 23rd, you can find me hosting the DC Books for Young Readers panel at 11.15 a.m. If you want a sense of what that might be like, make sure that you stick around for our Brendan Reichs interview. Brendan Reichs is an incredible New York Times bestselling author who is also right this very second promoting Clark and Lex, his DC book for young readers. So if you want a taste of what that panel is going to be like, make sure that you check out our interview. I'm so excited to be doing this. Okay, without further ado, why don't we get right into that? Let's chat with Brendan Reichs. Hi, Brendan. Welcome to Enter the Popverse. Thank you very much for having me. How are you doing today? You know, I'm doing all right. It's uh, blazing hot outside, but other than that, you know, I have a cave to hide in, and so I'm utilizing it. That's fair. That's fair. I was going to say on a scale of Clark to Lex, how are we feeling? But I feel like it's going to be somewhere in the middle today. It definitely is. You know, I'm not like full blown Clark, but I'm not exuding that Lex confidence that he uh, has at the beginning of my story. So I'm just somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in between. You've got to get like um, your hair game has to go up and out a little more to like to Lex confidence because his hair in this book is spectacular. <laughs> uh, yeah. You know, I mean, I, we, we're definitely going to give him hair because that was definitely part of the pro part of the idea for the character for me. And so they were like, well, what if he accidentally loses as we go along? I'm like, OK, but then it has to be fabulous to start. I mean, let's really make him look good. So, so, so good. But you are such a prolific prose writer. I saw that you were going to come into the world of comics. I was like, ooh, I recognize the name. Very exciting. Uh, so I wanted to ask, what has that transition from prose to comics been like for you? You know, it's interesting. Like uh, putting a story together is pretty much exactly the same. Uh, so that <laughs> hasn't been much of an issue. But like, you know, writing in screenplay format was interesting. And also writing for comics is so different. Uh, yeah. My original manuscript had something like 200 pages and it was chock full of like, okay, from behind left, shooting left to right across the cafeteria, you'll see him in the background. He's speaking. <laughs> and then my editor quietly nudged me. He's like, you know, someone's going to draw this, right? And I'm like, oh yeah, we should let him do his thing. So Jerry gave <laughs> an amazing collaborator on this project. And we're, I was just like, I'll take that out. And it just becomes there in the cafeteria, you know, <laughs> like I realized yeah. very quickly to uh, let the art become the art. Um, because we evoked uh, Jerry Gaylord, your incredible artist on this book, what was your collaboration like? You know, it was at first completely uh, separate. Uh, mm -hmm. I wrote the screenplay because I was really, you know, 
working from concept and I wrote it all out and then we, we shopped it after that. But I mean, working with Jerry's been great. Like, I mean, I'll be blunt, you know, he deserves all the credit for this book. You know, it's about the pictures, you know, my script is just something that makes his art flow. And he took some amazing, you know, risks and choices in this book and I supported them all. And so we got to sort of get back and forth on, okay, making things work and things like that. But uh, it was a really fun process to just let him let fly on what he found and, and what he came up with was amazing. Don't sell yourself short, though, because you've taken two of the most iconic superheroes, given them unique and different voices, and aged them down about 20 or 30 years from the way that we're traditionally used to seeing them. So I would love to know, like, what is your relationship to Superman and Lex Luthor? Were you a fan before you came in? And then how do you channel their youthful energy on the page? Uh, first of all, you can imagine... Uh the anxiety spikes that I provoked when I was, you know, pitching this project. And it was quite a process. I got to be honest. I was like, well, if I want to write this, this is really my vision, which was, you know, I wanted to do Clark Kent as an actual like 14 year old. And mm -hmm. I remember myself at 14 and I was a jerk. Uh, you're very, Ooh, you're stuck in yourself. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, I'm just thinking like if I had superpowers at 14, would I have had restraint? No, I would have used them for everything. And so mm -hmm. that, really what I was going for was like an authentically self-centered, you know, 14 year old who goes through kind of a coming of age uh, process. And uh, that took some selling. I tell you what, I'm like, <laughs> here's my idea. Superman as a kid, but a jerk. <laughs> you know, like, so they're like, Tell me more. And so that's yeah. when we sort of got it. I was like, well, what if we made them buddies with Lex? And, you know, we a lot of people played around with that relationship. Yeah. But I thought it'd be interesting to have Clex, Clark start off as sort of the mess and Lex have things together. And then sort of when they got in the mixer of these circumstances, what would come out? And so mm -hmm. I was very pleased and frankly astonished when I got the green light to actually create this project. And they've been hands off the whole time, totally supportive. And uh, I think that's why we ended up with something so great. It is. It's so fantastic. And also not not to like wade too much into spoiler territory because the book has just come out not too long ago for readers. Um, you get to we get to meet a lot of other interesting, super powered characters. So did you get to stretch when you were doing that? Are you referencing some of your favorite other heroes? What was it like to sort of build out this team that we see? Sure. When you get the uh, OK to do one of these projects, uh, your first thing is I'm going to pack every superhero <laughs> in the DC universe into this. Yeah. So then they give you the whole like, hold on, fella, let's uh, let's focus. And so I was mm -hmm. like, OK, but I still want a, a wide range of diverse characters. And they said, OK, yeah, go nuts, make up some. So I was like, hmm, well, that's even more fun. So, <laughs> you know, I was trying to find like the right competitors for the vibe, for the contest that occurs in, mm -hmm. in the story. And uh, so particularly like Taka Smoke and Jalen Boyd were two uh, that I thought, oh, these are interesting. They're, what mm -hmm. they can do is very, very interesting. And they're really going to challenge Clark because really this is a story about Clark's flaws and how events and people challenge those flaws until or if he can work through them in order to become the person that you know he thinks he can be or should be, but is kind of afraid to be. And so these characters are set you know, almost as like, mile markers in his path to becoming, you know, not self-centered, to becoming mm -hmm. a person who thinks of others and, and and does feel the responsibility of his abilities, responsibility of his abilities. That's a good line. You should yeah. remember that. <laughs> it's almost right? like you're a professional writer or something. Yeah, it, it's almost <laughs> like I can come up with another word besides abilities. <laughs> <laughs> I want to encourage people. I love I loved Jalen in this so very much. So if you haven't checked out the book, like keep an eye out. He's such a little sweetie and he's so cute in the book. And maybe, maybe, maybe an important crux of what's going on. You also do such a fabulous job at making Clark very human. So even though, you know, we all know Superman, he's the archetype for every superhero that we know. Um, but like you said, he really channels a lot of that 14 year old boy energy. But I think a lot of that comes through his relationship with Pa Kent, your version of Pa Kent, who I love very much. So what was it like trying to put your stamp on that character? Well, like, Everything you write, you're really putting yourself into the story. I mean, that's mm -hmm. kind of the secret to make something. If you write something but it doesn't have a lot of uh, emotional arc to it, a, a lot of character development, what you get is something that might be entertaining but is quickly forgotten. It's the books mm. that sort of you can identify with the growth that resonate and stay with you and you recommend to others because there's something in there, either consciously or unconsciously, 
you're identifying with. And with Clark, I just understood like that point in a, in a life where you don't know what you want to do and you feel like you can do anything. And you also feel like a lot of things around you are holding you back. And so the relationship, mm -hmm. you know, with uh, the older Kents is really meant to emphasize that. Like he feels so much power in his new burgeoning adulthood and yet is literally told not to explore it because it's dangerous. And so that I've always thought was an interesting dynamic in the Superman legend, you know, like how mm -hmm. would he really respond to that? And so I was like, I'm going to take a little bit more of a modern look at it and say, this is how I think he would respond in the beginning, which is he mm -hmm. wouldn't like. You wouldn't like being restrained. You wouldn't like being, you know, the bigger person. You know, I always cringed and was mad at you know, scenes of Superman getting beat up by the fence. I was like, no, whoop them, whoop them all. You can, you know, you, can. <laughs> but, you know, I, in my beginning of the story, I give him a little latitude on those points where he's not always going to make the right decision. And uh, that's what I thought is just exploring because at the end of the day, you know, he's growing up and he doesn't really know what he's supposed to be. And that could be for anyone, whether you have superpowers or whether you're just uh, going to, uh, junior high every day trying to figure out where you fit, what your place in the world is. This Clark also has a young, as a young person, a real love of journalism and writing. And I was wondering, is that channeling maybe who you were as a young person? Were you into writing when you were Clark's age? Well, I mean, absolutely. And like what I was saying a bit obliquely earlier is like, you always put yourself into whatever you write and that's the easiest way to tap those emotions. So for me, it was a lot of the same interests, but it was also a lot of the same frustrations. You mm -hmm. know, I too have got superpowers and I'm not allowed to use them. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's really mm -hmm. frustrating for me in general. Uh, I can't fly Thank around. Like being, I'd like. <laughs> you're gonna be brave enough to let us know about that. I figured now was the this was the forum for for that admission, <laughs> but uh, that's sort of what I wanted to capture, and and equally that like no one is born you know twisted or or mm -hmm. unable to overcome their character flaws. So I want to show Lex probably was at one point decent guy, decent kid doing the same thing, and you know I don't want to over emphasize how you know ad adult figures in our life can shape us, but you know they both have ironically, are dealing with the same issue, which is, you know, their relationship with their, uh, you know, family of origin, I guess. Well, origin is tough in this case for Clark, but I'll go with that anyway. Uh, right. And so that was like the struggle <laughs> they both had. They're both young men under the shadow of their fathers. And how do they react to that? Does it and, shape and them or does it destroy them? And Lex also, Lex does have moments of, of goodness. He's certainly very, very sweet when we when we first meet him. He seems like a nice guy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, that was my, I mean, that was an absolute non-negotiable. I'm like, no, Lex mm -hmm. is going to be great. He's going to be a good person. He's going to be a buddy. He's going to want an honest competition. And he's going to be, a hand, you know, helping hand. And, I, you know, he's going to be the more mature of the two mm -hmm. uh, when they meet. Uh, because Clark is all full of this angst and, and worry and, 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 lack of identity and Clark is going to not really be experiencing those things. You know, he's much more comfortable ironically in his own skin than Clark is uh, at the beginning. And so that was a fun way to sort of twist the, the usual way that these characters are presented. And I think you've really done a tremendous job at taking, again, arguably some of the most iconic superheroes of all time and translating them in a very welcoming and straightforward and exciting way for a new audience. You know, if, if in future you had a chance to write some other books at DC, are there any characters that you're sort of dying to get your hands on and to play with? Well, uh, not to uh, say it too loudly, but uh, this book uh, clearly would benefit from perhaps another one. Uh, uh. And I mean, the title <laughs> writes itself, you know, Clark versus Lex practically begs to be written. So it I does. definitely think there's more to work <laughs> with here. Um and far as the other characters in the DC universe, you know, I mean, I took such a big swing. I haven't even thought like, give me more. Cause it was, <laughs> man, I cannot so stress much. enough how, how um, in depth the process was to go ahead with this story, you know, cause it is, you know, the crown jewel of the DC universe that you're asking to, uh, to twist up and mash. And so, you know, there was a bit of uh, hesitancy, but you know, to their credit and, you know, to Jerry's credit you know everybody made it work in the way exactly how i envisioned it and so right now i'd like to stay on these guys but i think lois deserves a little bit of a say uh, i think there's other people yes. in this universe that could uh could show up in, in a later volume 
And with some, as someone with such a deep bibliography at your back, what advice do you have for any aspiring writers who might be watching? Oh, uh, my writing advice is, is pretty simple. Uh, you got to write all the time. Uh, practice mm -hmm. gets you closer to perfect. And uh, I'm a big believer in Gladwell's 10,000 hours and that anyone can write a successful story or a successful novel. It's just hard, but not mm -hmm. hard in the sense that you need some inspiration. I hear a lot of pain panels that I'm on and somebody's like, oh, I don't know where my ideas come from. They just, one day I sit down, they come and I'm like, that is not how writing works. Writing is work. <laughs> I mean, it's not a line. It's fighting through that day. You don't want to write anything. So it all comes out as like, you know, a C spot run. But the point is you get something on paper because books are made in editing. They're not made in the first draft. I don't know that anybody did more damage to the writing perception than Hemingway, who just sits down drunk and writes a book on a typewriter and it's done and he turns it in and he's a genius. But that's not really how it works. <laughs> Uh, in reality, it's a lot of drafts and editing. So, you know, get your reps in. The, the, your third book is better than your first book. Uh, and that's not to be intimidating. It's just to say, you know, you got to go through the process. But, and I say this every single time, anyone can write a, a great story. Anyone can do it. It can be learned. It is not an art. It's a skill. So do not, do not be discouraged. But, uh, you know, you got to finish. That's, you know, the other thing is finish what you're working on. People get two thirds way through. They're like, I don't know what happens next. You know, like, well, just power through and finish because uh, if you don't, you can never really send it out and get feedback. And that's really when you can call yourself a professional writer. It's not about getting published because you don't have any control over that. But when you mm -hmm. write a finished product and you let somebody else read it for criticism, that's when you're taking it seriously as a job. Well, like that went all over. The place. I'm not sure if there's anything totally useful in there, but uh, I feel like you just took us to church. Like that was great. Uh, and then my final question, lastly, but not leastly, because here in the pop first, we are celebrating the best in TV movies and comics. What are you geeking out about right now that you are not working on? So no Superman stuff. What am I geeking on right now? Well, I'm not going to admit that I was super excited about the, fast x because i don't want anybody to know that but i definitely am excited um for let's see which one's coming out i haven't seen the new flash movie and i'm excited mm -hmm. to do so because mm -hmm. i heard good things uh mm -hmm. and i also am looking for some of the stuff on the small screen that's uh mm -hmm. coming out like you know before i did this i had not actually watched a single episode of Smallville. And then I didn't watch any of it because I didn't want it to color what I was doing. I was terrified mm -hmm. at that point. No, 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 don't watch it because that might seep into your idea. But yeah. you know, as I get through this now and I've got a good footing in the world I wanted, I, I, I think I need to go through and see what they did there because that's something that uh, you know I hear all good things about. So I'd be pretty excited to see what 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 that project looked like. Oh, I was like, people are going to rush to your Twitter to be like, you must watch Smallville. <laughs> I don't know what I've just done. I, may, I might have made a terrible, terrible error, but you know, that's the best. It's, <laughs> it's truth. You know, I have to live by by honest principles. These, you know, so especially as a writer of Superman, you you simply must. It must be done. It must. It must. You know, that's why I kind of wanted to write him as a little bit of a liar, because then I don't have to live up to anything but that. Right. right? That's how well, it works. Only your main character, I think. Is yeah. that is that cool? Definitely not in future volumes. <laughs> no. No. Brendan, thank you so much for joining us in the pop verse today. Can you let everyone know where they can follow you online and where they can come and harangue you to continue uh, a deeper into your Smallville journey? Sure. This is the... This is the actual book. It comes out on the 4th of July. Yay, America. And I am available uh, everywhere. Luckily, I have a very uncommon last name. So if you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at Brendan Reichs. If you're looking for me on Instagram, it's at Brendan.Reichs. Very tricky. Uh, and I am on Facebook at Brendan Reichs Books. But that's for you older people out there. Uh, so I think that covers it oh and my website is brandonrex.com yeah it's pretty you see a theme here you can see uh -huh. you know there's a through line in my uh, my social world the branding she's strong we love it yes. thank you again <laughs> thank you so much for having me oh what a fabulous discussion brendan is such an 
interesting, interesting creator. And I really, really loved specifically talking to him about Lex's hair. That was a question that I wasn't sure I was going to get in there. And he gave such a great, great, great response. Check out DC Comics for Young Readers. They're some of my favorite books across the line. Okay, but some of my other favorite things about San Diego Comic-Con, I also wanted to share with you. So please join me in a traditional theater kid round of applause as we welcome back to Enter the Poppers, our unofficial co-host, Mr. Graham McMillan. Hi, Graham, welcome back. <laughs> I love how it just says scroll Graham now. <laughs> I love that's just my name now. Look, we're going to be keeping this bit going until redacted television series names, perhaps baby finishes. It's a good Which joke. is just another week. So yeah, there you go. Yeah. So we get one more week of, of Scroll Graham cut. So our next live show, we'll be wrapping and then, up. And then, the and then, yeah, they'll, then we'll finally retire Scroll Graham. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. Uh, but welcome. See, I haven't seen you in person for quite some time, so I'm going to be able, by the time people see this, I'll be able to tell if you're a scroll or not because we will be together in person. I am so excited to be able to see you again because it was what April? Emerald it was, it was Star City. War. No, it was Star Wars Celebration. Is that after Emerald City? Yeah. <laughs> time, time is confusing. Yeah. <laughs> as far as I can go, friend. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's it's been it's been a few months. I'm really, really, really excited to hang out. Same. Uh, last San Diego Comic Con fun fact for viewers was like one of Graham's first days. I think it was Robert. my third or fourth day, something crazy like that. Yeah, and it was your first show with Popverse. So mm -hmm. now we're back. We're fully baked. You've been here for about a year. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, ju I just celebrated my year uh, last week. Yeah, yeah, I just just recently I celebrated my first year. Yeah. So we so congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much for holding down the fort with us. As uh, I said at the time, I haven't been fired, so I'm gonna take that as a victory. I also nobody understands how much you are just propping up all things poppers at all times. <laughs> and I just want the internet to know that. Say nice things to Graham. He's very, very important to our structural integrity. Uh, but because we're gonna be at San Diego, we're actually at San Diego right now. Hello, future people. Uh, what are some things that you're looking forward to? Or maybe what are like some of your favorite San Diego Comic-Con memories over the years? Uh, I was thinking just before we talked, I think my first San Diego was 2003. Wow. Which means it's been 20 years. Which wow. is crazy to think about. It is. Uh, my first couple of San Diego's also, I did it because I had been invited to a panel. Mm -hmm. And I lived in San Francisco at the time. And I flew down from San Francisco, did the panel, and then left. So I didn't do the show floor <laughs> for for years and i remember the first time i did the show floor my first thought was i didn't know any of this was down here because <laughs> <laughs> i would literally come in pick up my badge go into the panel and then leave like immediately that's so wild <laughs> yeah it, and i so I, I genuinely didn't know any of the show floor was there and i'd go down and be like oh this is what they keep on saying comic-con is i get it now i understand <laughs> Um, I'm not going to tell you what I was doing in 2003, but my <laughs> first... Would, would it make me feel very old? Yes. Yeah, I thought so. <laughs> yes. I was definitely not in this country. Uh, I think my first San Diego Comic Con was either 2014 or 20... I think it was 2015. And it's wow, the only San Diego... That's a while ago. It's the only San Diego Comic Con where I have not worked actively <laughs> where i could just simply go and enjoy it um i have worked one... i've worked with being a panel every sunday San Diego. i've never done San Diego comic-con as a fan that's so wild that's so yeah. wild it's so strange when you think about it yeah do you remember what the first panel you ever saw was that you were not uh, on um it would have been a marvel or dc panel uh, because I would have been covering it for someone. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think what the first San Diego I worked as a journalist for the show was. Oh, it would have been io9. So it would have been about 2008 or 2009. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, yeah, it almost certainly would have been a Marvel or DC panel. And the... whatever they're published. I, I want to say 2009 was when Marvel announced that they bought Miracle Man. Y that, yes, yes, that sounds right. We could Google uh, it. We won't. And, and the um, and what I remember in particular was, it's possibly the only announcement at a at Comic Con where it was greeted not with excitement or or you know disgust or whatever, but just with utter confusion. <laughs> just two thousand nine. By the way, I 
I did Google it. You were right. There you go. You're, you're, you're a professional. Um, yeah, it was just greeted with entire confusion. <laughs> well, part, partly because, uh, at least in those days, all of the embargoes, all of the news would be given to you in advance. Yes. And they might not say exactly what it was, but they'd say, like, at this panel, we will be announcing X, Y, and Z. And it wasn't X, one of those. X, Y, and what, my Commonwealth brother? I, I've been here for long enough. <laughs> I, I've been here for long enough to Z. Uh, I refuse. Me, I will not learn. <laughs> let me tell you, watching Love Island and they say X, Y, and Z, I do have that pang of that, right? That's how it's supposed to be said. That's but no, right. I say Z, I've been here long enough. Do you say Lieutenant? I do. I know. I know. Traitor. Again, I've been here for a long Traitor time. Traitor to your I'm own sorry. people. <laughs> um, no, but so you used to announce, you know, we're, we're announcing all these things. Mm -hmm. And Miracle Man wasn't on there, which was thing number one that confused a lot of people. Ooh. Well, because it was, it was a surprise. It was a yep. big surprise. Yep. Uh, and thing number two was the number of people who just didn't know what Miracle Man was. Because it hadn't been in print for two decades by that point. But it was also a thing that, like... There had been like lawsuits and, and like confusion over who owned it. Was it Neil Gaiman? Was it Tom McFarlane? Was it other people entirely? It, it, it was like a thing if you were a, a Wednesday warrior, right? Or if you were on those early message boards. Mm -hmm. But I don't know mm -hmm. if it permeated outside of specifically like comic book, high geek comic book pop culture. <laughs> and, and yeah. And so, so many people were like, they, they bought what? And yeah, it, yeah, it's yeah. a big deal. What's really funny is that was 2009. And yeah. This year is the first year they're going to put out a complete collection in trade paperback. Finally! The first comic book shop that I ever worked at, which was not this one, this is Earth 2, but the first comic book shop that I ever worked at, which doesn't exist anymore, used to have some of the OG Miracle Mans up mm -hmm. in, like, on the expensive on the tier. Yeah, yeah, you know, because yeah. it's, like, pricier the higher up you go. Mm -hmm. um, and that's actually how I learned about Miracle Man for the first time, was being like, <laughs> what is that? I've never heard of this. <laughs> that was back when you could say who wrote it without getting in trouble. I mean, yeah. I mean, you could still say it. I don't know if you get in trouble, but you get, like, a... I, I, I'm just saying, I would not say it because I do not want to incur the wrath of that man. Same. I, uh, big, big same. Uh, I've, I've heard the duck song, so I don't want to incur the wrath. <laughs> uh, the first Comic-Con panel I ever went to uh, was at David Aja Spotlight panel. And it was right when him and Fraction's Hawkeye run was like real, like the hottest comic yeah, yeah, yeah. That was in, the the, thing. Yeah. in the world. And that was where I first learned that that book is, it's, you see the flats. They don't do a complete color pass on it. And that's where I learned what flatting was. And you were like, this is how they make comics? I, I love I that stuff, though. I, 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 I really like San Diego. I, I think San Diego is a Comic-Con. It's a really fun Comic-Con because it is mm -hmm. one of the big ones. You know, in my head, because I'm old, I keep thinking like, oh, it's the biggest one. And it's really, like, it's really not. It's, it's yeah. you know, it's not, I'm not even sure it's number two anymore. Um, I like even, it even I like in, North in San Diego. <laughs> <laughs> I love um, San Diego, the city. Oh man, can we talk about some of our weirder San Diego uh, panel experiences? Yes, let's. Were you around for the Heroes in Crisis? Panel? Girl, yes, I sure was, and um, because <laughs> of some different things in my person, I knew a lot about Heroes in Crisis as it was unfolding. Yes, let let me tell you, <laughs> the Heroes in Crisis San Diego panel was on board a yacht. And you had to RSVP as press. You had to RSVP. Yeah. Um, for people who might not remember Heroes in Crisis, because even that's five years ago now, which, again, we're old. And who um, got their Heroes names scraped off of it or added on to it? And, uh. Heroes in Crisis was an event book at DC by Tom King and Clay Mann. And the gimmick was there is, what's it called, Sanctuary? There was yeah. basically a, 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 a place where superheroes went to recuperate after... Uh, emotionally scarring experiences. Yeah. And there was a murder there, and the, the series is a murder mystery. And so they announce it, and they're like, we're doing a panel ahead of launch. Uh, it's on a yacht. And I was like, great, why not? Like, this sounds great. I like Tom King. This is going to be fun. Little did I know that when you get on the yacht, they check your name off, and then they give you a, a dressing gown. A, a white dressing gown with a gold DC logo on the back. Uh, and then they explained that it's a spa that you're at. <laughs> and you go on the deck of the yacht and you sit. By, and there was a lot of us there. This was not like a small number of people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and we're all sitting there in our, in our dressing gowns. And Tom King is in front of us. Uh, surrounded by people in masks. Yeah. Talking about the series. 
Somebody really and then left, mid- like, midway through the battle, the people serious. in masks take off their masks, and it's Mitch Grant and Clay Man. But it was the most surreal experience <laughs> to go on a yacht and for them to be saying, "Like, here, here's your dressing gown. Go and like Namaste. Go and sit on the floor of the Namaste. Yacht. Go, Namaste. Go and go sit on the deck. Me more like <laughs> it was. It was genuinely weird. I still somewhere have that dressing gown. Uh, I'm gonna say, please bring it onto a future. Please wear it for a future episode of End of the Podcast. Uh, I sell. Th- there's not so much San Diego swag anymore. There used to be a lot, a lot yeah. of like uh, the year promotional DC, giveaways. The year DC gave out the We Are Robin jackets, my biggest failing was not getting one. I wanted one so bad. I, uh, I also I love We Are Robin. I have an original page from We Are. I think it might be from Robin War, but I love that event. I love. Do that you want me to event. tell you and everyone else uh, the greatest and then the most expensive? thing i've ever gotten as a journalist is it an ipad that's the most expensive yes yeah an no, actual working full ipad which is still to this day insane like yeah. four years four or five years after it happened i still cannot quite believe that someone gave away an ipad to all the press attending the event well, yeah what room in their corporate office was just filled with, they were like yeah give them an ipad as we were leaving they were they were like, uh, can we have your email address? And I was like, sure, why? And then they were like, oh, because. And then they opened up a cupboard. And there were just boxes of iPads. <laughs> it was amazing. Um, the greatest one is, and it's it's over there. I would turn the camera around if you wouldn't see lots of messy things about my office. Uh, the Flex Mentalo Hero of the Beach Beach Towel. Oh, yes. That's very cool. Which is a, a wonderful thing that I... I love very much but no that san diego is san diego had lots of weird experiences like that there you mm-hmm. know there, there's been there's been times where things happened that did feel like events you know and i'm not just you know people are like oh holly h and then this happened no like things happened i mean even last year's um top mcfarland panel yeah was nuts was yeah. genuinely crazy but like with all love and respect, it's a Todd McFarlane panel. No, and I, I and I, I'm not saying that to like I'm not saying that to this Todd McFarlane yeah, at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it was no, amazing <laughs> that he came out and was just like, I'm just gonna t-, like he announced it. I'm just gonna talk at you for an hour, and we were like, okay, like this will be fun. Todd's yeah. like fun. Todd, Todd's an entertaining <laughs> speaker, and then he just immediately launched into. COVID, let me tell you, everyone yeah. should have brought toilet rolls. And it, that was the moment where you thought, I have no idea where this is going and I'm here for it. I'm here for everything that's going to happen in the next hour. Your Commonwealth came out really hard on toilet rolls. <laughs> <laughs> See, no. I've, been here, I've been here for that long, but apparently toilet rolls. Is Not as acclimated as you think you are. <laughs> um, one of the wilder things that I saw happen at Comic-Con was right when, right after Man of Steel, I don't know if Batman v Superman had come out yet. Um, Ben Affleck and Zack Snyder drove the Batmobile up to the Hall H line and like delivered pizzas to people. Oh, I remember that. And again, I through some people knew that it was going to happen. So we were just kind of like, there was like a clump of us like at midnight loitering outside of the Hall H line, like waiting for this. Okay, to but, but can we talk about the Hall H line? Again, I've been going for, Never been in Hall H. Never, ever, not once. I, I've been going for maybe like 19, 20 years. Yeah. Um, I remember when you could walk into Hall H. You could just I've heard stories in. about when you could just walk in and buy a ticket. Yeah, right? Uh, and now, at least last year, like Hall H, you, you were waiting in, even if you had the ticket, even if you had a pass, you were still waiting in line for hours slash overnight yeah. to get in. Fun fact, the, like, year, the year Leonard Nimoy died, the day Leonard Nimoy died, I was on my laptop trying to sign up. It was back when if you were a pro, you got a free per, a free guest. Now you have to pay for them. Mm-hmm. Trying to get my, my pro badge and my guest badge because you were in that big virtual queue. And I got a text from Jason Amin that said, just in case no one else has told you, Leonard Nimoy died. And I was already crying in frustration at like the onboarding process of getting my badge. And then I was like crying over the death of Leonard Nimoy and my birthday twin. <laughs> and it was such a surreal but specific experience. You're like, this, this is, you're like, everything about this is bad. And yet I cannot explain to you exactly what kind of bad. Yeah, but like my, it's at least my good. next week is ruined. <laughs> it's, but Comic Con and San Diego Comic Con. Mm-hmm. 
it's funny we say Comic Con because that is the short version of San Diego Comic Con. Yes. Right. But um, but San Diego Comic Con is such a weirdly insular experience. It is because it takes over the entire city. Yeah. You know, you go to New York Comic Con, which is a, a significantly bigger show. Yeah. Like dr- drastically bigger, but New York just keeps being New York. Do you know, what I mean? New York right? just don't New care. Is... Yeah. New York could not care, and yet San Diego, San Diego Comic Con takes over San Diego. Yeah. You can't I, get away from it. I always feel bad for, and you see them in your hotel or you see them in the gas lamp, those nice people who came because they s- still think it's okay to patronize SeaWorld. Uh, and they're down there for the weekend and mm-hmm. they like don't know what all these sweaty people are doing. I always feel bad for all the people who are working in the hotels and restaurants and everything who feel obliged to be Comic Con y. Yes. And yes. so they're wearing like, you know, the Green Lantern t-shirt or they're wearing like a makeshift mask and they're like, hey, are you here for Comic-Con? And you just kind of want to say to them, you don't have to pretend you like it. It's fine. Yeah. Like, like you really don't. I like, I, you're like, I'm already tired. I get it. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all. That's the other secret of, of San Diego, right? You are, you're tired from like day one. Yeah. yeah. San Diego is, is such a, a weirdly, like it's such a weird bubble. That you get through on weird momentum and just surrendering to the moment. And then yes. when you get home, you're like, what actually just happened? And then it's an exercise in being like, look at my pedometer. Look at how many steps <laughs> I lost. I've, ne- I've never done that. I've never. And I keep every year, I keep meaning to actually remind me this year to actually do that. Okay. Um, because it's almost certainly the most exercise I'll get in a year. <laughs> Okay, so next next week you're gonna wear your bathrobe, your uh, DC cult bathrobe, and I will have to do... find out if I really do still have it because I have gonna... moved like twice since then. <laughs> we're gonna do pedometer check in. We're gonna see between us who walked more steps in a single day. Oh man, it's gonna be you. It's definitely you think? yes. You have so much more to do than I do. <laughs> That's the other thing. So we are recording this uh, the day before we leave. Yeah. The day for when this, this thing starts, and both of us have, have like have our schedules of what we're about to be doing, and I I do you have the same thing where you are simultaneously excited and just seriously daunted? Yes, uh, yes, every single year, one hundred percent. You're just this, like this will be great, but also oh boy. Yeah, this year for video, it's it's a little different than last, last year. We were like yes to everything. Um, and this year, because of obviously various circumstances, it's just a lot more slimmed down, mm-hmm. which is honestly nice. Like I keep saying like Comic-Con's going to be about comics again. And I'm really excited to see how that plays out in sort of the larger ecosphere of San Diego Comic-Con. I will, uh, I will look forward to talking to you next week about that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All I, right. I think it's going to be fascinating. It's going to be a super fun, happy time. It's going to be great for like, you and I are going to have a great time. <laughs> oh no, we're going to have a great time. Here's the thing. I think there's going to be so much to genuinely enjoy and mm-hmm. genuinely to have fun with. I and there might be the room to... to breathe and do that. I also think there's going to be a lot of very upset people. I I do I do too. And so that's going to make for a, a really genuinely wacky experience out of a show that is always a wacky experience. Yeah. I would also like to encourage people, if, if you are... If you have an issue in some way, please be nice to the person who's helping you because they don't know the answer either. <laughs> <laughs> I, it's also really weird because if you think about it, we're like the people watching this are not the people at San Diego Comic Con because they're there. No. Yeah. Or they're coming later. Right. That's some true. You might, you, might, you might be coming Saturday, Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hi, everyone who is not there. Uh, you're, you're, you're probably more sane and less stressed than we are. Right. Well, on that happy note, Graham. Yes. Thank you for joining us, Scroller Dot, in the Popverse today. <laughs> Tell everyone where they can find you online and harangue you this uh, San Diego Comic Con. <laughs> uh, well, you'll be able to find me at San Diego Comic Con. Uh, I will be the one who apparently is not as acclimatized as they thought. Uh, and I'll also just be tired. Uh, and you can find me on the internet uh, at my name there uh, with an M at the end uh, on the Twitters. <laughs> bye graham thank you for joining bye. us bye graham thank you graham for joining us now i know there's a good chance that you are here because you saw the incredible multi-hyphenate that we have here on enter the pot first today the founder of noir caesar entertainment which does comics and 
multimedia entertainment work, professional basketball player. Please join us again in the traditional theater kid round of applause in welcoming to Enter the Pop First, Mr. Johnny O. Bryant. Hi, Johnny. Welcome to Enter the Pop First. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited. You are our first manga guest, so I give you wow. the crown and thank you for being a part of this with us today. Oh, really? Thank you. Thank you. I got to make sure. I, uh, it's a lot of pressure, so make sure I live up to it. <laughs> There's no pressure because you're setting the gold standard by which everybody else will be measured against today. <laughs> perfect, perfect, perfect. So I know that you're like a huge anime and manga fan and that Toonami was a big part of what brought you into the creating space. So I want to dig a little deeper into that. I want to know like, what is your comic book origin story? What is your manga origin story? How did you start reading? Yeah, so um, I actually, I got into anime before manga. Um, mm -hmm. I grew up a big comic book fan. Was really, was really, I saw more comics around than manga. And so um, anime, I kind of got into it just from television. It started with uh, Disney. I think Disney had like a program, like a, like a special hour where they would show, I think it was called JetX. Back yes. In yeah, yeah, JetX. And they would show <laughs> like um, Digimon, Beyblade, Pokemon. And so that was kind of like my intro into anime and manga. And um, and from that, I started getting into Toonami, um, which they had, which Toonami back in the day, they had an anime block that would come on right after school. So it would start at about three mm -hmm. and it would end at about six or seven. And so, um, it would show like Dragon Ball Z, Yu Yu Hakusho, Gundam, uh, just very different anime. And I remember as a kid, like thinking like, wow, this is a lot more, a lot more cool than, um, you know, like SpongeBob or just, the, you know, <laughs> yeah, like the traditional Western cartoon. So yeah. um, I would run home after school every day trying to watch the new, newest episode of Dragon Ball Z and Yu Yu Hakusho. And, and that's really how it got started for me. Um, and then when I got to high school, um, one of my high school teachers, who, who's actually a co-founder of Noir Caesar, uh, Marcus Johnson, um, I saw him reading a One Piece manga. And, uh, so I was like, hey, what's that? And he was like, oh, man, you know, the anime that you watch, they make, they actually make the books for it. And I was like, oh, no way. And so um, that's when I started getting into manga and researching and reading different uh, manga. Oh my gosh, that's incredible. We should all have, we should all be so lucky to have a mentor like that. So, yeah, sure. so it's an important part of your upbringing. It's like a thing that you're a huge fan of in multiple mediums. You go on to not only hit the American dream of being a professional athlete, then you say, I'm going to make some of these on my own. So what was the impetus and the inspiration for starting to create your own anime and manga? So um, once I got to the NBA, I um, started like I, said, I was still watching anime and I just kind of noticed at that time it wasn't a lot of um, black and brown characters. It wasn't a lot of um, Western style storytelling. So I was like, it actually started with kind of wanting to create my own anime. Right. And mm -hmm. so that was, that was very ambitious, <laughs> very ambitious. <laughs> so, um, once I did my research, talked to some people in the business, I realized that, OK, this is very costly and it's probably not going to happen. All right. And so. Um, I started talking with Marcus about ways to tell stories in a very high quality but cheaper way. Mm -hmm. and so we we started the publishing company, Noir Caesar, and um, really our main goal was to, um, I really our main goal was to tell more diverse stories from a from a point of view that you know you really don't see mm -hmm. in the manga. You know most. Uh, obviously most manga and anime is made in Japan. So the creators are Japanese. And so, um, you know, they're telling stories from their point of view, what they see every day, their childhood. And so I wanted to do the same, but take a lot of inspiration in terms of the art style and the world building. And, you know, typical, those typical things that you saw in anime, but combine them with a more of a Western style of storytelling. So just to like get into the weeds of publishing a little bit, you've also done the very modern thing of, it started in digital, then it goes to print. Now you've partnered with Tokyo Pop, which I think for so many of us who grew up reading manga, we were like, Tokyo Pop is is the is the yeah. the king, the emperor, the lord and savior of, of all things anime. So like what was what was that trajectory? What was that sort of decision making to start in digital? And then now you're literally um, everywhere accessible all over. <laughs> yeah. So we we really was just starting 
because like I said, we were very indie, very new to the business. And so we were really just trying to get our books out the, the quickest and the most um, efficient way. And that was like digital, right? Letting people, letting people buy a, you know, a PDF and read the PDF. And so that was, that was really our first, I guess, initial, initial phase. And then it went from that to, okay, let's go to a couple cons. And then at conventions, we noticed like, you know, we took a couple prints. We might've took a hundred, a hundred prints of, um, each of our titles and then we went to these conventions and we sold out and so we were like okay well i think we got some with the print model and mm -hmm. so um we started doing print print ourselves for a little bit and then i met Stu. um i met Stu a while ago probably back in 2016 Stu mm -hmm. Levy, the owner and founder of tokyo pop and so we we just kept in contact and then um i think about two years ago um you know, our, our, our paths crossed again, and uh, we were able to um, figure out, you know, a way for North Caesar to collaborate with Tokyo Pop. And um, it's been a, so far, it's been an amazing experience, man. Those guys do a lot of things when it comes to diversity and, um, you know, just making sure every audience is hit. So it's been amazing so far. I really appreciate you giving this specific date of 2016 because it sort of illustrates that it takes a long time to get this stuff done and it takes a long time to get it done the right way or like in a way that you are satisfied by. So can we, can we jump a little bit into the weeds? I want to talk about exogenesis with you for a second because I love it so much. Here's, here's my like fun fact, fun story about this. Um, I do a bunch of theater here in Los Angeles and we always do like a secret Santa and once a year, especially when we were doing all digital gifts, like a Noir Caesar collection or bundle was gifted to someone else. So amongst our cast, wow. we were you were like super, wow. super uh, wow. responsible for like a lot of our shared, um, a lot of our like shared love. So uh, Exogenesis was the first uh, Noir Caesar book that I ever was gifted um, in a secret setup for, for Christmas a few years ago. I want to ask about Darius. Wow. Um, our lead, of course, because he's like a super, super talented athlete. He has all of these artistic skills. He cares about his family. And the more I've gotten to know you through interviews and through our chat here today, he seems a lot, a lot like you, at least on paper. So I wanted to ask how personal his development and his story is for you. Yeah, um, theirs is a very near and dear character to me. Obviously, he sits in the back of my office. Yeah, here. yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> But he definitely was a big inspiration to me. I think um, Darius um, was a kid that, you know, I wanted to, like I said, I wanted to, you know, if you're from Japan or you're from Asia or what, you know, just somewhere across the world, I wanted you to pick up Exogenesis and, you know, and hear a story from my point of view. And that's really what I was trying to do with Exogenesis. Darius is, like you said, he's an athlete that kind of grew up in a difficult environment. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he's, you know, he's was able to kind of, you know, um, manage and manage and grow from that environment. And I think that, you know, his his physical gifts and tools were able to help him um, overcome and get out of that environment. And Exogenesis is just a story of, you know, a guy like Darius kind of rising through the ranks of a sport that he loves. And um, and on top of that, he's you know, he has a little bit of you know artistic ability. He loves to create. And he's just an overall kid dealing with, you know, the struggles of growing up, being a professional athlete, what comes with it. Um, you know, as we get into the next volume, you'll see Darius kind of go through, you know, the struggles and the depression of like, I've made it now. It's kind of, uh, what, what do you call it? Imposter syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, just going through different things that I think a lot of athletes go through when it comes to mental health and just um, doubt, you know, the, the mental strength that it takes to um, power through as an athlete. So when you are building the teams who are going to tell these stories, is it similar to trying to build a great sports? I'm trying to do a sports metaphor here. Please. Uh -huh. <laughs> How do you go about picking like the incredible talent that you have from exogenesis to like fourth rope, like everything well, under more season? Yeah. So we were, we were just fortunate um, to meet a guy named Nicholas Draper Ivy, who's mm -hmm. uh, right now he's probably one of the most popular artists on social media. And so at the time, um, he was a, you know, he was an illustrator, really known for his kind of, um, you know, exactly what we were trying to do. He was really known for taking a lot of inspiration from Japan and, you know, anime and then putting his own kind of cultural twist on it. And so we were lucky and fortunate enough to come across Nick at a time where he were, you know, he was still 
kind of um, underground and a lot of people didn't know about him. And so we were, you know, we were fortunate enough to um, work with him on Exogenesis, which is actually his first comic book project. And so, oh, wow. Yeah. And so now I think he illustrates Static Shock and he does a lot of different things with companies. So um, the guy's super big time now, but we were, um, <laughs> yeah, we, we were super fortunate to work with a guy like Nick. And then, um, you know, the guy who also Trey who helped me, you know, write, um, co-write Exogenesis. So it was, it was, it was just an overall great experience. We all were young and kind of inexperienced in the comic book game. <laughs> it was, it was, it was fun time. So. You say we were young, like it's past tense. We all know you're just a cute little 21 years old. Okay. <laughs> I would also love to know how you balance, you know, two incredibly demanding and difficult careers. So are you taking calls and sending emails while you're on planes? How are you making this happen? That's, the, that's exactly what I do. So <laughs> I, I train, like I literally, I wake up at 6 a.m., start my training. And um, I'm trying, you know, normally I'm trying to be done by, 12 p.m. and then from 12 p.m. I'm in front of my computer working, sending emails till about you know four o'clock. You know, and then that's when my kids come home. And so then it's time to be a dad, you know, for the rest of the day. And then unless then after they go to bed, I may, you know, I may do a business call or business meeting or finishing touches. But I mean that's pretty much my day is just like, you know, spend about three fourths training. I mean spend about one third training one third business and then one one third just trying to be a family man so and then you sleep like in the shower <laughs> yeah of course i, I get I, I try to get my six to eight hours in for sure <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, a lot of the titles under Noir Caesar are super genre heavy. Like it's a lot of really fun sci-fi and mm. fantasy elements. So what appeals to you about like science fiction in particular versus maybe a slice of life? So um, just growing up, man, I, I really love um, I really love like science fiction movies. Mm -hmm. um, I really love like fantasy and heavy action. You know, I guess typical guy. Right. But I, I, really, <laughs> loved, uh, <clears throat> I really love those things. And so um, a lot of times as creators, I think, you know, as creators, we all go through this. So when you're first starting to write or create, a lot of times in your first couple years, you kind of pull a lot of inspiration from what you like, right? Mm -hmm. you, you're trying to make, oh, I grew up a big fan of this and I'm trying to interject this into my story. And this is like this power system or this kind of world. And so you see a lot of that early on with a couple of our titles, um, just me trying to um, find my way as a creator or you know whoever the other writers were on those titles trying to find their way as creators. And so, a lot of the stuff that we love really bleed bleed into those titles and um and the world building and then the further we go like with um fourth row the title that we have coming out is a um is a wrestling series and i grew up a really big uh, wrestling fan um with my old with my older brother and my uncles they would all sit around the tv and <clears throat> excuse me and yell and shout about um <laughs> they would all sit around TV and yell a shout about who's gonna win and Aww, this and that. And so, that's so I was awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was a kid, like I was a kid that was like really, really like, you know, enthusiastic about Monday nights because I'm like, okay, wrestling about to come on. And, like, <laughs> and the cool thing about that was like um the characters and the the characters in the worlds of, of it was so was so brilliant. And those guys were doing a great job of selling themselves. And so with Fort Rope. It's just our spin on on that, but also adding a little bit of intergalactic flavor, a little bit of over the top comedy and action and just all those things. So yeah. That's so interesting because like when I think of um Primus Seven in particular, the world each of the each of the islands, each of the areas of that story are so rich and each of the characters are so rich, but they could also be like a superhero coom wrestling persona so i i want to ask to get into the weeds a little bit on this if you had to maybe live on primordia where which land would you want to live on because so you yeah, so you really did your research i sure did <laughs> so primordia primordia is basically like earth you know i guess the the you know if you combine all seven continents into one place, right? It'd be primordial. So yeah. um, there's like undiscovered 
lands in Primordia. I think. Um, Go on. For me, <laughs> for me, I would love to. I, honestly, I think um, Red Siren, the, the place where it starts, is like a really good, like a really good place. It's it's it's, it's like a melting pot of all the cultures. Like if you think mm -hmm. of, you know, if you think of you combine New York and Manila and Tokyo, just all these worlds into one kind of melting pot, you get Red Siren. And I think you know, I would love to just kind of visit that area and a lot of different. A lot of different things come from there. So I would love to definitely check that out. <laughs> I can't wait until we get the inevitable live action movie adaptation. We can just see you like walking mm. through the background <laughs> and all of the scenes. Like Noir Stan Lee, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Noir Caesar is a multimedia company. Of course, we've, you talked about starting with like, I want to make an anime. How do we make an anime? We've talked a lot about the comics so far, but tell me about animation and film and what the hopes and dreams and maybe plans are for the future yeah so what um we you know we expanded our stuff um we started north caesar studios uh, which is a branch of noir caesar and so we were able to um partner with a studio in the philippines um that does a lot of work for netflix and they do a lot of work outsourcing work for um company studios in japan so they've worked on series like psychopaths and naruto and just so many different series they worked on. So we were able to partner with them and then start um, a branch called North Caesar Studios. And so with that, um, we met our producing partner, a guy named Arsalan based in Hollywood, really, <laughs> really amazing guy. And so he's been helping us um, expand our te television and animation division. And so um, I can't say a lot, but I think we, we, have, we have about four or five original titles that are being adapted into either an animated series or a film or a live action TV series. So um, it's really, really dope. Um, you know, you'll be hearing a, a lot more about that in the media soon, but um, we're, we're definitely, you know, we, we've got our hands in um, a lot of live action and television. And I think also as a company, um, you really just start with a passion to create. Mm -hmm. um, and then from that, you have to kind of like really learn the business of comics and the business of, Hollywood really fast. And that's what we had to do. We really just started as, cause it's, it's co-founders, it's myself and then three other guys. And so we really just started as passionate kind of anime and manga fans and comic book fans. And, and then it went from that to like, like really like, oh, like we, we have something here and we really have to start um, taking a lot of business meetings and learning, doing more research and, studying <laughs> and, and learning about the business of anime and animation in Hollywood. So it was, um, it's been a fun ride. That's so exciting. And I hope you will come back and you'll talk to us when we can, you know, when some of those things are out in the world a little bit more, we can pick your brain about the anime, the live action side, the television side of things. The uh, last question I wanna ask you, cause I've already kept you longer than I promised, um, is what are you geeking out about right now that you're not working on? Ooh, like just what, just something in general. Anything, whatever you're enjoying, so, are you? So you're enjoying sci-fi. So speaking of sci-fi, yesterday, <laughs> um, the company group chat, like one of the co-founders dropped a trailer for the movie The Creators. Yes. Oh my god. Yes. <laughs> and, I, and I saw the trailer, and like I was like, wow, like that's a cool story, right? Like it's so, um. Like you could tell the, the budget was good. They got big name actors. The plot was great. I mean, it's all based on the trailer, right? But um, it's so in the times because with AI and robots, this stuff being developed, a lot of people worry like, oh, well, you know, someday will the AI turn against us and take over the world. And so it was just, from what I saw in that trailer was like really, really cool. Um, it's something I, I'm excited to see whenever whenever it comes out. Also. Um, the English, the English version of Slam Dunk movie just yes. dropped in theater. So I have to go see that at some point. Um, really want to check that out. Um, and then uh, something else. Um, yeah, um, I mean, I, I think that's about it. About yeah. I've been checking out. So I think uh, with those two are, are just two recent things that got me like really, really excited. Amazing. Johnny O'Brien, thank you so much for joining us here in the Pop First. And I know we're going to have you again sometime soon. Thank you for having me. Incredible, incredible podcast. Thank you. Bye. That was.
so cool. like I I have no words for how amazing that was. I really, really, really can't wait for Johnny to come back and to be sharing even more of the incredible work that Noir Caesar is up to each and every single day in the world of anime, manga, and so much more. Now, we teased a little bit about some of their upcoming projects, some of the things that they're working on, and I do have a trailer to show you from Noir Studios Entertainment. So buckle up, friends. We're going to check that out right now. Yeah, not too shabby for some independently produced anime. I can't, I truly can't wait for Noir Caesar to continue its supremacy of all cool things, anime and manga. Friends, we've reached the end of the show today. Thank you so, so much for joining us here in the Popverse, especially for these like double stacked episodes that we've had week after week after week after week. It is so fun to be able to bring all of these incredibly talented people to you to share what they are getting up to out there in the world and how we can celebrate them best here in the Popverse. As a reminder, every single thing that we talked about here, if we have more articles, more features, more references, you can find them right down there in the show notes. Or as always, you can find everything Popverse at the popfirst.com. All things under the pop first can be found there as well. And get yourself a pop first membership, why don't you? So you never miss out on a single solitary thing that we are doing here. As a reminder, I have been Ashley Victoria Robinson, your video producer and host here in the pop first, a virtual realm created by Read Pop. And right now, right this very second, I am standing boots on the ground at San Diego Comic-Con. You can find me there. Please come up and say hello. If you see anybody else from the Popverse team, please come and say hello and let us know that you are here supporting us and that you love each and everything that we are getting up to. Again, you can find me on July 20th hosting the Jeff Lemire Spotlight panel. You can find me on the 22nd as part of the Hey, That's Just Like Me when superheroes represent their readers. And you can find me on July 23rd hosting the DC Books for Young Readers. Before you leave today, why don't you do what that nice little ticker says and like and subscribe. Make sure you click that bell so you always get notified whenever we have, one, a great new video, no matter what it is, but especially, two, a new episode of Enter the Popverse. All right, my friends, thank you so much again for joining me. Stay safe, have a wonderful day, and I will see you next time.